Hello, everybody. Oh. I don't think I've been applauded up before. <laughs> uh, well, I'm Cozy. I'm first year here, um, ending my first year here. And um, I've been uh, very fortunate to help Liz uh, coordinate these Monday, uh, no, Wednesday sessions every, every month. Uh, the year has flown by. And before we get to Nicholas, um, I'd like to do a little recap of the year. Basically, um, we, we've had a lot of people every, uh, come over the past year, uh, one every month. Uh, we started off with Erin, and she, uh, we had an impressive slate of uh, alumni come. Erin's at Twitter right now, and she told us about how she's, um, her design approach has been inspired by her experience in rowing. Um, and then afterwards, we had Nikki, another alumni, and she talked about how her pro pet project, which was uh, basically trying to revamp parking signs in um, cities. I'm sure everyone has a, a tale to tell there. Uh, and um, she's gotten cities to pilot her, um, her, her new project, which is really exciting. Uh, Shelly came to talk about how um, designing for public services is a unique challenge. And um, Ian Curry from 53 um, talked about how um, they approach prototyping in a very um, in a place where like the product's really complex, so they actually have like a prototyping team in house to do that. Um, we had uh, Andrew and Tallinn from Adobe. Andrew designed Adobe Portfolio, um, and uh, Tallinn designed Adobe XD, which was Project Common at the time. And we had a great uh, conversation about the unique challenge of designing for designers. And uh, Peter Morville, uh, he's an information architect, uh, wrote the Polar Bear book. And he uh, basically urged us to think more about like, everything else that's connected um, to your design or your product when you're, when you're designing something. Uh, we had a little closed session with Seth Johnson. Uh, he showed us um, how IBM approaches um, design thinking and how they do design. And uh, last but not least, we had Ellen Lupton. And um, she talked about how like, when we design stuff, uh, we should think about like, how it affects like, other sensations. Uh, and these are other excited first years with her. Um, and so we've covered a whole slate of, of, of interaction design, uh, but one topic hasn't been talked about, and that is data visualization. So when you think about data visualization, there's really only one name, Nicholas Felton, that comes to mind. He's known as the author of many personal annual reports that weave numerous measurements into a tapestry of graphs, maps, and statistics reflecting his past year's activities. Um, he was one of the lead designers of Facebook's timeline, and as the co-founder of datum.com, and also uh, created Reporter, which is his most recent product, an iPhone app designed to record and visualize subtle aspects of our lives. His work is part of the permanent collection in MoMA, and has been profiled by Wall Street Journal, Wired, Good Magazine, and recognized as one of the 50 most influential designers in America by a fast company. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Nicholas Felton. Thanks for the, the kind intro, you guys. Uh, it's nice to be back here. I saw uh, I taught here for one year, um, I think in the second year of the program, and uh, had a really great experience with incredible students, and I saw one of them um, on screen here, uh, Aaron Moore, who works at, at Twitter now. Um, so, you know, normally um, I talk about these things, um, tables of numbers, how I collect them, what I do with them, um, but tonight I'd like to talk um, about the, the right side here, about photographs and aggregating them and extracting information from them. Um, so with the numbers, um, these are the kind of things that I'll make. Uh, this is the cover of my latest annual report. Um, but on the right, again, is this aggregation of these photos. So um, this is a woman who was taking selfies of herself for several years and then someone took them and mash them into this, this one averaging of all the photos that I find really transfixing, and it tells you a lot um, about that set of photos. Um, so um, I see photos as this kind of way of like marking important moments in our lives. Um, it's almost a sampling tool, and that's similar in some ways to uh, Reporter App, which is um, one of my products that allows you to just take a moment and sample it. You talk about the kind of things you're doing, your activities, and it captures metadata. Um, while our cameras are doing the exact same thing, there's this content aspect to it, which is the image, and then the metadata that now goes along with it, like location and timestamp, um, the type of camera, um, even altitude. All these things that your camera can know can get jammed into the metadata of these photos. And uh, 
Just today I saw this article in the New Yorker um, by Om Malik um, titled, In the Future We Will Photograph Everything and Look at Nothing. And it's basically about how you know, photography has become this really um, impending medium. It's, it kind of sits over everything we do and how it's being influenced by, by big companies. But um, I like this little piece of it about how photos are less markers of memories than they are web browser bookmarks for our lives. And just as with bookmarks, after a few months, it becomes hard to find photos or even to navigate back to the points worth remembering, which I certainly relate to. Um, so these days when people talk about data, it's typically this kind of like data overload, big data. Um, I think this Christoph Neiman little doodle kind of you know, talks about the, the confusion that happens in that space. Um, but I also see a sort of you know, similarity with photography. You know, we're, we're just, like I said earlier, we're photographing everything. There are photos that you know, we never thought might exist um, that we now have access to. And when I look at my camera roll, um, this is my iPhone, um, the number of photos in my iPhone camera roll over time. Um, and when I started thinking about this, um, it was in 2013, so it was on this like, you know, infinite logarithmic trajectory. And as you can see, it's kind of evened out now. Um, I think in 2015, my cat died, so that might have something to do with it. Um, but you never know, there could be a baby around the corner that shoots it back up into the stratosphere. <laughs> um, so, you know, my, my, my camera roll maybe has plateaued, but if you look at the, the arc of cameras being sold, you know, it's, this is, Cameras as we traditionally think of them, like analog or digital SLR, um, but this is with smartphones included, and it's just um, an insane trajectory that they're on at the moment. So, you know, talking about volume, clearly um, this is just the number of cameras being sold, but I think the number of photos would mirror this. Um, we're also, just the hardware itself is so disposable now that pretty much anything that you can put a camera on is getting a camera. Um, and you kind of see this in people trying to you know, sell you cameras to have in your home, um, to wear on your face, um, to put on your drones, and you know, we're probably, I know I'm certainly on camera right now, you guys are probably on camera as well. Um, and then it's kind of like velocity side of it. So one of the ways um, that I think about this is um, the emergence of persistent cameras, um, like this one called the narrative, it's a clip-on device. The idea is it takes a photo every 30 seconds throughout the day, and you know, ultimately you wind up with close to a million photos a year at this rate. So how do you make sense of all these things? This one's beyond bookmarking. This is just marking everything. And when you think about the kind of origins of photography, um, I think of Henri Cartier-Bresson, the kind of uh, father of photojournalism. And he was an advocate of this idea of the decisive moment, that every photograph was kind of, um, you know, you were looking for that collision of like the right expression and the right composition all coming together in one thing that you then take a photo of and save it as a photo. Um, of course, this is in an era where uh, negatives cost money, developing costs money, prints cost money. Um, but we wind up with these kind of, you know, super iconic photos um, and even the, you know, the asterisks that go next to it, like um, the raising of the flag at Iwo Jima that I think is at least the second time that photo um, was taken, it was sort of reposed so that they could get it perfect um, for, the, for the army photographer. Um, and so this is another kind of iconic photo that I think of from the history of photography. Um, but it is this intersection of one camera and one specific decision in one moment, all coming together to form this image that is the, the expression of the idea at hand. And so if we think about now, I think that all those things have changed. Um, we're looking at multiple cameras, many decisions that may have been included in it, <coughs> or even just a, an incidental action that resulted in that photograph in many, many moments. And so how do you start to make sense of all these things and talk about the stories that come out of them. And I think that's a, a very similar problem um, to what we face in data viz, and that the results can wind up with being similarly descriptive. Um, this is a diagram that I made to try and understand the relationship here between photography and what I'm thinking of as photo viz. I don't think it captures everything, but it starts to talk about this kind of section of um, the space between how much time you're representing and how much time it takes to consume it. So um, 
you know, linear video is kind of a one-to-one -one relationship between how much time you're representing and the running time of the medium, like the time to consume it. Um, versus slow motion is going to take longer. Time lapse will be a shorter relationship. Um, and then photography is kind of just at the, uh, the origin there. While photoviz can talk about these longer moments, but with a very um, condensed um, ingestion time. So there are all these different techniques that go into making things that I consider to be photoviz. Um, and I think, you know, the kind of original bug or failure of photography was that it took a really long time to expose negatives. They were not very sensitive. So um, this is one of the first photographs. Um, it was in the set of, I think, three that um, Louis Daguerre showed off when he was kind of introducing his work. And it's widely considered to be the first photograph of a human. And you can see this figure down in the corner with his foot up. Um, and the thought is that because this photograph took about eight minutes to develop, this is probably a guy having his shoe shined. And that's why um, he shows up in this photograph. Of course, it was a very busy Parisian street with plenty of carts and people running around, but nobody stood still long enough. So in some ways, this is a visualization that separates everything that was moving from everything that was standing still in the scene. And um, for me, is, is that first kind of um, data viz, this long exposure that came along with the, the initial photographs. Um, we can see in the work of Frank and Lillian Gilbreth um, how this technique and like some uh, early light painting was applied to their studies of um, work efficiency. So these are people who are doing their routine tasks and they're trying to figure out the motions involved to, um, to optimize those motions. Um, another photograph in this kind of long exposure category are these works um, by Alexei Titorenko. These are from the collapse of the Soviet Union and these are kind of the crowds that were lining up in St. Petersburg um, to get food. And this was, you know, it's a more artistic impression of it, but it certainly gives you a sense of, um, of what was involved in, in these food lines right after the collapse. Um, when you start adding strobe into these photographs and, um, again, more light painting, you can start to get this, like, push and pull between the object and then its implied motion. So here we see um, a helicopter um, taking off, or I really like these visualizations of a violinist at work. So, you know, we're just seeing that one moment of him bowing the string, but we can see the kind of history of his movements that go into it. Um, all these kind of illuminating objects and self-illuminating ones, um, when put in this long exposure context, start to get really interesting. Um, with these fireflies, you can see kind of their, the mass of them, but you can also make out individual trails um, as they pass through the trees. And so, of course, on the man-made side, um, looking at airplanes, we start to get these trails of multiple airplanes coming into, um, into land at airports or to take off, which for me is simply a smaller version of this true data viz piece by Aaron Koblen. So this is called Flight Pass, um, which is, I think, a day's worth of um, flights across the United States that he's, of course, built up from data. So he's got all the coordinates of these airplanes and He's basically creating a long exposure photograph here that would be impossible to, um, to find a lens that you could take. It's also separating it from all the other glowing things on the planet. But you know, to me, these are just the same thing, but at different scales. One you can shoot optically, and the other one you have to create computationally. Um, this is kind of a smaller version of it. This is when you turn off the lights and let your Roomba bounce around. Um, <laughs> this is a visualization of its paths. and. Um, it's actually surprising. There are n several people who've done this, some people with multiple Roombas, and it's a really cool look at um, the algorithms involved in how it navigates the space, and I'm sure as the hardware has evolved, you would get um, different representations based on, on each, different, um, each different model. Um, this one, some of you may be familiar with by um, the defunct agency Berg, I think is a, just a brilliant, um, kind of hack on using long exposure photography. So they wanted to map out the radio frequency waves around um, the Oyster Card, which is the UK kind of um, touchless pass system for the subways. And so what they did was they made a wand with a LED on the end, and they just 
probed the space around the oyster card. And every time it detected the signal, it would light up. So given enough time and enough um, activations of the LED, you get this, um, this field that reveals the, the EMF field around this card. Um, and this is another application of this idea. So this is, um, here you can see the hardware. It's just like a two by four basically with a bunch of LEDs on it connected to a Wi-Fi detector. And I think this is in um, Helsinki. These guys walked around uh, the campus of their school and as the Wi-Fi signal went up and down and they were walking, it would um, create different readings. And so you're, you're mapping onto space the, the invisible signals here. Um, and I think these, um, the person who led this was also involved at Berg and they've also done a set of sort of similar GPS uh, mapping photo series. Um, these ones are, are mostly beautiful, but also show the motions of a kayaker paddling across a lake and through a stream. And he's done the same with swimming. Um, and this piece is, is actually kind of manufactured. So this is, you know, if you think about like Picasso's light paintings, this is doing a light painting, um, <laughs> but with a robot um, arm. So it's computer controlled. And this is taking Tahir Hempel's hip hop data um, about different rappers. I think it's uh, Tupac on the left and Biggie on the right. These are the places that they talk about mapped around um, the sphere of the globe. And he's done this for, for several different artists. And you can start to see the differences between sort of like Kanye and Jay-Z's globetrotting styles versus um, the more local people like, like Biggie. Now we're getting into kind of computationally um, assisted long exposures. Um, these are, this is like a, a series of nudes, but the way that they're stacked um, is, is constructed from a video or a series of photographs to create these really like volumetric shapes that express the, the movements of the dancer. <coughs> and these ones I quite like um, as well that show the paths of um, clouds over the course of the day. Um, so as you know, we've, we've gone all the way to the present day with that long exposure approach, but I think you can even, um, you can even start to capture these kind of more meaningful images with just a simple snapshot. So um, I like to think of these kind of pictures as you know, expressing the history as well as um, the moment here. So we start to see the sense of you know, where, the, where the pedestrians are, are moving here. And in some ways it kind of mirrors photography. We're getting this kind of emulsion that's spread on the ground and then all the marks that happen start to create trails that, that express the, the behavior here. Um, this is kind of a man-made version of that where um, if you put four different pools of paint at the corners of an intersection, um, the cars start to draw out their patterns as well. And you can see it very clearly, especially in the blue one, um, this, this pattern, this trend of all these cars turning right there. Um, Contrails, of course, for planes are these distinct trails that happen. Um, and then when you turn that into a kind of controlled um, form, you start to see its, its utility in analyzing fluid dynamics and looking at how this impacts um, cars and forms in a wind tunnel. Um, another approach here that is, is along these lines of sensitizing the environment, this is called Schlieren uh, photography. And the idea here is that it allows you to perceive really minute changes in, uh, in air temperature. Um, so you can see um, the hot air created by a candle or in a gunshot, you can see the sort of the waves there of compression as it um, changes the air density and also the heat coming off of the gun. Um, and finally, this example um, that you've probably seen before is this kind of then and now um, thing where you're taking an older photograph and putting it in the new context. So it's almost you know, augmenting reality. It's this window back into the past. Um, this one is really well done and also showing something that you know, you'd probably have no idea was in this, at this intersection um, where the, the Statue of Liberty was constructed um, in Paris. Um, I think motion is the, the obvious um, way of, of adding more moments into photography and it was kind of the, the next evolution. Um, but I think, let's see if this works. Uh, yeah, so I think cinemagraphs start to achieve a kind of like hybrid of um, the movie and of a photograph. So we're getting more information here, but actually it doesn't really matter if you look at it for one frame or you know stare at this for, for minutes at a time. Um, it's kind of um, 
it's additive the longer you look at it, but you're not missing something like you might with video. Um, ranking is certainly something that um, we're all encountering as a way of dealing with this kind of photo glut um, that's, that's upon us. And so if you think about Facebook or like the Instagram Explore tab or even um, the app called um, for narrative, which is the way that you deal with all those um, photos created by the persistent camera. Um, these are all trying to take signals, be they social in terms of likes or um, hashtags or, um, or signals that are in the like GPS or just analyzing the images, try and show you the right photos at the right time. And I think uh, beyond this, what's interesting is how this is actually impacting photography and the photographic profession. Um, so these are, or this is an example of how photography is kind of being outsourced um, to, to all of us. So if you're at the right place in the right time, like you know, if you're on the Hudson River when Scully landed that plane there, um, you're getting a photo that's going to be elevated through all these kind of social and um, software ranking systems to the point where your photograph's gonna be on the cover of the newspaper. And I think that's, that's a big difference uh, between the way things were 10 and 20 years ago. And so this is another example of a, of a plane crash um, that happened in San Francisco where you can see this photographer, Anthony Ra, was kind of co-opted by Reuters um, for his photograph because he was one of the passengers on the plane and had this photo. And so when you start to think about it like this, there's, um, you know, there isn't really like, um, there's fewer and fewer opportunities for professional photographers at newspapers and um, I, I know that certain newspapers have actually gotten rid of them completely and they're like, oh, we'll just get it off of Twitter or um, wherever we need to or off the wires. Um, multiple exposure is this idea of, you know, certainly this is an obvious one, taking several different photos and putting them together or, uh, you know, opening the shutter at different times um, to create these uh, merged exposures. Um, I think this one is one that was really fascinating to me in my, my research. This is called an analemma. And at the, um, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but at one point there were more people who'd made this photograph than had walked on the moon. Um, what it is is it's if you take a photograph of the sun every day at the same time from the same place, you get this figure eight that's revealing to you the kind of rotation of the earth relative to the sun. Um, so this one, I guess on the, on the left, they open the shutter at three different times. So you're getting three figure eights um, versus the one on the right where it's just a simple one. I'm not sure what the, the smears come from. Maybe those were mistakes. Um, but yeah, now with digital technology, of course, it's much, much easier to make this, but in the past, um, you know, this is both informative and um, compressing all these different moments into one. Um, with the invention of um, the strobe, people were able to, to start shooting athletes in this way. Um, and this photographer, Gijon Milley, did a lot of really interesting stuff along the lines of um, Harold Edgerton, who shot the apple with the bullet going through it, or that famous milk drop that's frozen in time. Um, they were both experimenting with these kind of ways of creating multiple um, frames of exposure on a single negative using really, really fast um, flashes of light to freeze their subjects. And for me, this, this becomes like a photographic diagram. So here we have this illustration of a, of a pole vaulter, um, and you're demonstrating all the steps, um, which is great and very informative. But I think this approach is also really amazing, and it, you know, is, is much more immediate and relevant to the subject at hand. It's less universal, but it's telling you so much about you know, his facial expressions and which muscles are being tensed in the process of, of getting over this high jump. Um, another way of doing this is kind of, this is getting, you know, a bit more advanced as well, is of just taking several different photographs and then um, you can do this for RGB or CMYK, um, just assigning each one of them to a different color channel and starting to merge them. And um, of course, all the areas that are in motion start to be highlighted. Um, and I think, at least in this case, the result is really, um, is really interesting of just this man um, wave gesturing with his arm. Um, in a kind of analog to you know, working with data, I think averaging um, averaging is really interesting, but it also um, kind of can have the same downfall as averaging in, in data. So um, this one's quite interesting. Uh, Noah Colina, who 
has been taking a selfie for the past 15 years. And so each one of these represents a year that has been averaged. And so there's, there's a lot of stuff you can take away here. You can see kind of how his technique has improved and he's lining up his eyes and his face better, um, which may have something to do with kind of like baby face look in the, in the top, getting down to the more bearded and, and sharp look further on. Um, I think he was also more consistent about his background later on, so you see that starting to come through, and of course the beard and um, his face aging over time. You can also start to point out these kind of tropes that exist. This is, um, if you average the US president and the, the Russian leaders, um, you get these, this real distinct view of them. And I think the mo one of the most successful ones I know is this project that looked at yearbook photos from um, you know, 110 years, and here you can really see these kind of, um, not just like the tropes of photography changing, but I think you can even see um, like the racial makeup, I think these are American yearbooks, but you can see sort of like race playing into it, um, style, um, even expression. No one smiled at the beginning and then they're all smiling, you know, starting. Yeah, it's a, it's a very like discreet evolution. Maybe in the 1950s, 60s, it's starting to turn into a smile and by the two, 2000s, um, it's about as wide as you can go. Um, other artists, um, this um, Jinook Jion has done a lot of averaging, both with people, trees, um, and with buildings. So when you've got these kind of points of focus, like this gas station, you start to get a sense of like their average locations. Um, or this really informative one that the New York Times ran that's um, averaging the snowfall for 2013 and 2015. And you know, if you were here for 2015, you, you will recognize it on the right um, versus 2013, which is a more um, usual kind of distribution of snow for the, for the Northeast. Um, panoramas are not something that you normally think of as, um, as a, this kind of like time compression mechanism. Um, certainly you can take a, a panorama with a camera that just has a really um, wide angle lens and everything will be taken at one moment. But typically it's kind of like a rotating um, thing and certainly with our phones, we're turning our phone. So um, this is a panorama that I took at um, the Grand Canyon and I just wanted it as an example of a, of a standard panoramic photo. But then I started looking at it and I wanted to talk about this idea that you know, the left was taken at a different time as the right. And I noticed this thing about it, that the same guy is in it three different times. Um, so he's fully formed here. Um, it looks like he's turned around maybe to take a photo in the middle. And by the right, he's, he's leaving the frame. So either I was moving really slowly or he was, he was booking or maybe a, a combination. Um, but it's not something you really notice at this photo. And it's certainly not the point of the photo. The point here is you know, the vastness of the Grand Canyon. Um, but there are these little like subtle surrealities that are happening in it that um, are there if you start to look for them. And I love how people are starting to, to play with this um, in these like digital compositions that our phones are giving us. Um, Jim Hauser is, I think he was saying that he had a kid who wouldn't stand still. And for him, this kind of manipulation of the panoramic uh, camera really captured the, the sort of ethos of his child. Um, and I love this one of his daughter and all her changing expression as she runs across the frame. Um, slit scan is similar, but it's kind of the opposite. So instead of taking your camera and moving it across a scene, the idea here is you're just shooting one pixel at a time um, vertically and then stacking them all up. So it can kind of hurt your brain to think about this, but this is the result. So, you know, just think about one pixel here. And so what you get, um, it's kind of, it's calibrated so that people, if they walk through it in a normal walking speed, they appear normally, but the background is not moving. So it just gets completely extruded. Um, and then the bus, you know, you can see it's moving faster here so the people are more condensed. Um, and I think the people walking the other direction just get erased. Um, so that's why everybody's moving in one direction. And it's really cool when you apply this to different things. So this is the beach via slit scan, which at first looks normal. And then what's really, I think, mind-bending to think about is that these are, these are the waves just passing across rather than you know, against the horizon. 
Um, and another manipulation of that um, by the same guy who did the, the first black and white one, Adam Magyar. Um, this is a series he did called Stainless. So this is still a slit scan, um, but it's you know, perfectly calibrated to catch a train going by on the platform. And what you get is this perfectly lit subject that's also kind of infinitely long. Um, but also keep in mind that what's happening, you know, depending on which direction the train is traveling, what's happening on the left is at a different time than what's happening on the right. Um, and this um, Japanese artist, Masu Kazu Matsumoto, takes this to a whole nother level. So he's getting, if you've ever seen a coal car, they go on for, or a coal train, they go on forever. Um, and he, so he's figured out how, both how to capture this and how to squeeze it onto, onto one sheet of paper. Um, and I think the results are, are really beautiful. Um, mosaics, of course, are a way that we kind of start to navigate our glut of photos that we're creating. Like, think about your camera roll and how you can zoom out and out and out on it. And it can be cool for, for finding these sort of differences or for making collections, um, like this set of sunsets. And I think of it as the, like, the one in the many because it has a texture to it. Um, it has this repetition, but you, it's also a tool for finding the outliers. Um, and this is a real sort of strong data application of it. This is um, someone in Beijing who was shooting the same view outside of his window every single day. And you can see these kind of um, smog storms that happen, these long intervals of gray that happen. Um, and as you know about Beijing, that's kind of the, the big problem there with their, their air quality. Um, and I, and I, for me, this is much better than a graph or like some calendar view of it. This is the real visceral um, direct evidence of the, uh, the event that I think um, is very evocative. Um, with this stacking approach, um, the idea here, I mean, it's, it's kind of a form of collage, but I think the idea um, when I talk about stacking is that you're trying to use it as this, this like cut up window back to the original subject. So, you know, whether it's done with slices that talk about different times of day, or this one that I love that's looking at um, an entire year. So you can see the seasons change through this view of the trees um, outside his backyard. Um, this artist, Fong Ki Wei, has done amazing things with this technique and starts to get more artistic playing with the composition of the buildings involved, um, and even getting expressive with um, starting to change the um, the times of day and how they're revealed. And he's even started making GIFs that are really beautiful uh, that, that highlight these changes. Um, I think when you apply it to people, it gets really interesting as well. This was an experiment by Dylan Mason on trying to see, you know, if I take, I think this is probably a year as well of slices. Does this reveal more or less about me? Um, and um, on a shorter time scale, this photographer Nerhal um, takes video of his subjects and asks them to sit still, but then kind of makes all these prints, stacks them up, and then carves away at them. So you can see how people are moving through time um, through these slices. Um, this brings us back to the kind of now and then approach, but this time trying to, to do it as a, as a much more subtle um, view back into the past. Um, and people have done amazing things with this. Uh, the New York Daily News has a series where you're kind of looking back in time at, at New York streets, um, also in... Uh, in Europe with World War II, people looking back to all the photographs taken then, or even projecting them back onto the scene. Um, I think what, where collage kind of uh, differentiates itself from the stacking approach is that <coughs> it doesn't have to line up. So we're not trying to create this window view anymore. Um, with these Lomo photos, you have to work a little bit harder. Um, we've got different times involved here, and also the subjects moving and the cameras moving. And I think one of the best applications of this is the work of David Hockney. So this is kind of our um, a kind of cubist view onto the world where um, we've got you know, four faces here and all this repetition that's happening, but the, the scene still stands together as a whole. And you can understand the, um, the changes that are happening through it. And I think it tells you more than just a, a simple photograph would. Um, this you may have seen before um, by Evan Roth, which is his audit of the Sky Mall catalog. Um, he did all these things like dogs versus robots. Um, I think this is um, white people versus people of color in the Sky Mall catalog. Um, and you know, 
Like, why make a graph when this data visualization is so much more effective? And, um, and then another project that I love that's kind of defunct now is um, photo, uh, Photosynth by Microsoft. So the idea here was that given any sort of large set of photographs, it could rectify them in space. And so you could start to navigate you know, either your whole set of photos at a place or everyone's photos of Notre Dame and start to place them into the right um, perspective. So as you moved around, they would still form the, the view. Um, blending is one that, that we see a lot. Um, and I think here the idea is to, to do really sort of photo perfect um, composition. So this one is one of the actual inspirations for this project. Uh, and I was really sad to, to learn that it's the story that it tells is not really truthful. This was just someone um, who was shooting Hanover Airport, or started with Hanover Airport, but then just added all these different planes of different sizes that would never take off next to each other, and different liveries that don't fly to the same airport. So inspired by this, um, Mike Kelly actually did the real thing. And this is, this is um, amazing. This is LA, LAX for a day. Um, and these are the real planes that took off. These are the real planes that service LAX um, from his day of shooting. Um, and you see this a lot in sports. So Red Bull is very um, fond of this technique for showing their extreme athletes in motion. Um, I think it works well in baseball. And I feel like every year, the New York Times, um, or every time the Olympics roll around, the New York Times picks up this technique again and has done cool things with it. Um, I love this, this skier. And I've se recently seen another photograph of ice skaters and the speed skating. And two of them make the turn, and two of them fly off to the side. Um, and um, Pe Peter Funch does such a good job of this that a lot of times you don't even realize that this is a composite. Um, his, his way of working is just to stand on street corners like in New York or in Midtown and to shoot and shoot and shoot and then look for patterns and combine them. So um, you know, I, think, I think this is so much more effective than any sort of statistic I could give you about the number of people who yawn on a, on a New York street corner in a given day. What's cool is that these kind of techniques have even started to weave themselves into our technology. So Google has a feature um, that they used to highlight called Auto Awesome that's probably not even something they draw attention to anymore. The idea being that if you take a set of photos and you're smiling in one and your friend isn't and he's smiling in the next and you aren't, and it's just like, oh, we'll just take all the smiling photos and stitch them together. So you know, maybe this is a a better version of the experience you had. Maybe it's a, a less true version. Um, I think, and probably most people won't even notice. They'll just think, wow, my photos look better on Google. Um, so getting into some of the hard data that, that comes with our photos. Um, certainly metadata is something that, that I've worked in with and people have done really interesting um, explorations of. Um, I know my metadata the best. Um, and in 2012, I included it in an annual report looking at um, how many photos I took over the course of the year. So you can start to see these, these clusters of interestingness. Um, I can see my trips, like one to Japan, um, going to Alaska, start to show up in the density here. And the big dots tend to represent something interesting, like a, a wedding or a fireworks display or um, you know, something that I'm prone to take a lot of photos of. Um, here you can see some, of the, some more of the details. Um, there was a music festival there, a conference that I went to. And I imagine this would be the same for most people. Um, I've also looked at the GPS um, coordinates that go along with my photos, which I find really fascinating. Um, if you don't have GPS turned on for your photos, I think you should just turn it on. Because um, you know, it's, this, it's this way of really cheaply mapping where you've been, what you've found interesting along the way. Um, and certainly in aggregate, I think it can be stunning. So the work of Eric Fisher um, has done a lot of work looking at Flickr sources or Twitter sources. And you can see the resolution that comes out of this kind of metadata. Um, we can basically reconstruct the city and streets um, through this mashup. I think this is tweets and Flickr um, combined for New York City. So the, the, the kind of last frontier here of um, analyzing photos is actually semantically understanding what the content is. Um, and again, this is something that I've 
<coughs> excuse me, worked on manually before. Um, even in the first annual report, um, I went through all my photos and you know, figured out that 1% of them contained cats. Um, in 2012, I was counting the animals that appeared as well. And in 2010, um, when I looked at the life of my father, he'd left behind all these slides, and so I started to look at them as well. And I wound up in this position of, um, this is probably not too dissimilar from any automated approach, where there's kind of a known context and a lost context, or one that hasn't been described yet. Um, but then there are these, these um, signals in there that can give you a discoverable context. So in this case, there was a tiny piece of text that said Salinas Rodeo, so I could pinpoint that. Um, and this little van said Dijon on it in a European square, and by using image search, I was able to look up, or to confirm that this was in Dijon, France. Um, and probably, you know, if it's not the case yet, it will be soon that like most pieces of text that exist outdoors um, will be contextualized. So this was a gravestone that he was standing next to, and I was able to Google that and find the Wikipedia entry for it and figure out where it was. Um, and, you know, a lot of people do projects with um, Google satellite images and Street View, and it makes sense because these are some of the, like, you know, the best, most structured photos that exist in the world. And certainly, and we're probably not that far away from being able to take, you know, a photo of uh, a building or of signage and to be able to pinpoint where it is based on, on that data, s data set. Um, so given that kind of context or content analysis of the photos, um, some of the things I was able to do with it are like graph these um, different locations over time and subjects. So the white, um, the white bars are people, while the, the blue ones are places, um, and start to look at other things like um, how many locations there were, where he was, how many selfies he had, um, pictures of his vices, his favorite waterfall, um, types of animals. And, um, and we see this again um, coming in via Facebook now um, with its you know, really impressive ability to identify people. Even when you're making strange faces, it doesn't seem to be, to be thrown off. Um, through APIs like this one, I played around with a little bit called Imaja, um, which will take a photo like seen on the left, and you can see the output here that's pretty, pretty dead on. Um, and you know, the stakes just keep getting higher and higher and higher. So I think this was, this was probably like a year ago that Google was doing this. Um, and then about three months later, they were starting to automatically be able to caption photos you know, with, with different amounts of success. Um, the left are the accurate ones. On the right, we're kind of getting into absurd land. But it's certainly just the beginning here. Um, and actually, one of my favorite apps of the, the last few months is one called Forevery that's made by another um, image recognition or content analysis API called Clarify. And I've got about 20,000 photos on my camera roll. It's entirely unmanageable, but it's now organized them into places, things, time. You can train it to identify people. Um, you can search for tags like breakfast or uh, one that I show people is lobster when I'm demoing it. And it's like, yep, those are all the photos I've ever taken of lobsters. It's like five photos. Um, so I think you know, the frontier here is changing kind of week by week, um, and it's really interesting to see where it goes. Um, and so I think you know, the, the questions to ask now are, you know, if we think back to um, the Cartier-Bresson idea of these single photos, um, you know, does the fact that we're having more and more and more data, both about photos and in the world, mean that we're getting better representation? Um, certainly looking at this solar graph, which is another representation of how the sun travels across the sky, I, you know, my, my gut instinct would be to say, okay, you know, I need to do some calculus and like figure out the position of the sun and get some weather data to figure out when to not draw the sun in this thing and then maybe you know, mash on the context of where this was taken from where which, and would lead you to some kind of you know, sterile graphic of it versus this, which I think is very evocative, is the actual um, story being captured. Certainly a lot harder. This probably took six months to capture, but is, doing, is telling exactly the same kind of story that I would want to tell um, through data viz. And so you know, I think we've got all these different techniques that you can pull out of them. Certainly having 
shared perspective, which I think you would have noticed in some of these um, photos, is, is one of the, the key pieces to being able to add them visually. Having this similar framing, um, same perspective is very, very helpful. Um, but we've also got content, time, location, um, social signals as well to play with. And we wind up in this situation where I think you know, these are both good representations of me, but one is this curated image. You know, this is one of however many um, that have been taken of me that I've selected, and I have to say, this is how I want to represent myself. But actually, the one on the right, which is just um, this flattening of all these selfies that I've taken of myself, is more, more honest in some ways. I think it's about it's the last year or maybe 13 months, and you can kind of see this like remnant of a black eye there. That is not, it's not the photo I'm going to use for my, my profile picture, but it is a part of of my history and my identity that starts to show up um, through this. And the analog to me here is something that I found really interesting on one of the first products that I worked on, um, Datum, where we've got this kind of curated image of ourselves. Um, in this case, this guy really likes Lupe Fiasco, and so he wears the t-shirt, and that's our kind of um, curated version. But if you look at the data, you know, it's only number three on his list of Spotify music. He's actually much more a Macklemore guy when it comes down to it. Um, and so this is the nuance that you get when you look at data um, and you find these different ways of associating to it and you know, the, the additional honesty that comes, that comes from it. Um, so if you liked this stuff, there's now a book um, where you can, you can see these examples and more. Um, but I also started a blog, it's photoviz.tumblr.com, um, where I'll be posting these things as I find them and going back through some of the research that I did for the book that didn't make it in and, and putting it up there. Um, and you can find me um, on my website at feltron.com um, and on Twitter and Instagram at feltron. Uh, thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So I forgot to say this, but now we move into a little moderated Q and A. Um, I've got a list of seven questions here, and then afterwards we can open it up to everyone. Um, I guess the first question is like, what triggered this interest? Like, was it one defining photo vis that you saw, or like this had kind of been stewing in your mind for? A it while? kind of it kind of seeped into the projects that I was collecting mm -hmm. that inspired me. Mm -hmm. And I have, a, I have another Tumblr that's Feltron. Um, and that's just where I post like data viz things that I think are really interesting or generative art. But mm -hmm. there were a lot of photos, um, certainly a lot of these projects that showed up there. Mm -hmm. And then it turned into a folder on my desktop where I was like, I think they're all connected. I just, I don't really know how or what to call them. Mm -hmm. But um, I was starting to see all these analogs between my process and the way that people were making these images. Mm -hmm. and certainly like the aesthetic and um, descriptive attraction that I had to them made me want to do more with them and, and tie it together somehow. Yeah. Um, I noticed, I was no noticing as you like pull up different examples that there's like certain subjects that are particularly suited for photo viz. So it yeah. seems like motion is very suited mm -hmm. for it while like when you talk about the averaging, um, yeah. it's like really good for time. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you noticed that like there are other subjects that like are particularly suited for this and others that are like really not good for, for oh, like photo vis cannot convey. Yeah, well I think you need these points of connection between them and you know there's some, there's some data analog there, right, where if I just give you like a scrambled table, it's gonna be hard to bring um, any information out of it. Mm -hmm. But if you have like nicely organized data where all the rows are the same, you can start to talk about it. And I think you need the same for this kind of approach. You need mm -hmm. points of connection um, you know, you either need like location data on it or, you know, similar subject matter or certainly like the framing of something is going to make it much um, easier to tie it together. But I also think that this is kind of the beginning of this. Um, people are getting so smart with the computational approaches that they're, they're taking to photography. Like, mm -hmm. you know, people are doing all this work on depth cameras and, you know, someone with a good algorithm is like, no, we can make 3D images just from like a normal photo with a neural net, so we don't need that anymore. Mm -hmm. I think all this kind of like intuition and extrapolation of images that's happening um, can start to do really interesting things. Yeah, I wonder if um, that was one thing that I was thinking about was like 3D approaches to this. And now you know like Autodesk has that thing where you can take like 30, 40 images and yeah. they like all um, collates into like one 3D model. Yeah. Have, you, have you seen examples of 
3D examples of photo. Yeah, there was, um, so I think that technique's called photogrammetry. And there was one interesting project. It was hard to, and it's hard to put in a slide or in a book, but um, it was footage from World War II of a plane flying over Berlin, over a street in Berlin. And then someone was able to take that and turn it into a 3D model. And then of course you can like 3D print it. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, and when I, so I, I taught a class based on this briefly. And one of the most interesting things that came out of it was someone who put an LED on a MakerBot, or maybe it already had one, mm -hmm. and did a long exposure photograph of it. Mm -hmm. So you get the object, but you also get this volumetric mm -hmm. um, light painting of the object at the end of it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, I, um, I noted that you had mentioned something like, you had touched on the idea of manipulation uh, when you showed the plane, uh, the plane photos. And you, uh -huh. you said, yeah, the, the first one, you had been a favorite, but then like, you realized that someone had manipulated it. And I was oh, wondering, yeah. like, um, it seems to me that photo viz is probably less easily manipulated compared to like data viz, because like, um, you know, with data visual, like with data, like anyone can like make up numbers these days. But with photos, you have to have like photos. Yeah, but you got Photoshop, so that's true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I guess less easily manipulated, maybe. I don't okay. know. Yeah, I mean, I th I think you have to be skeptical of all photos these days, right? It's yeah. so easy to you know make these make mm -hmm. things that didn't happen. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. you need trusted sources and. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're probably in some ways it's probably harder to validate. You know, mm. I think there's a, there's a good culture of transparency with data mm. at the moment, mm -hmm. um, and maybe not the same if people start start working more in this way. Yeah, do you, but then do you see like perhaps some kind of standard forming of like photo viz trans, um, transparency? I, I mean, I'd love <laughs> to see that for all data viz. Like here, you know, here's the original data set. Yeah, here's yeah. the source material, and here are the transformations that led to the final thing. Mm -hmm. Um, comparing, um, con continuing this theme of comparing data viz to photo viz, mm -hmm. um, do you, which one do you think is more intuitive? Like when you s see at first glance, you immediately get like there's a message there. Yeah. Because um, like data viz, like you know, we are probably like very familiar with, with charts now, and we know like you know what they're trying to stand for. Um, but photos, like um, they speak of something they were like, comp consist uh, consistently looking at. So yeah. like, you know. That might be more intuitive. Like, do you do you have a? Yeah, there's like a give and take. I thought it was interesting working with the publisher of this book because um, there are a lot of photos that you you don't notice it until you read the caption, or then you're like, oh wow, this is this is totally different. Like um, a lot of the photos by Peter Funch, like the yawning photo. Yeah. Um, it's almost a game looking through them of trying to figure out like what's what's the thing that he's pulling out here. Oh, everybody's carrying a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. um, so they can be very, very nuanced. Gotcha. Um, do you see these techniques being um, commercially applied? So, you know, like with data viz, there's like business dashboards these mm -hmm. days, analytics, and there's a whole market there for it. Yeah. Of viz, yeah, do you see like- Yeah, so um, there's a company called Fleur that makes one of these home monitoring systems. It's a camera. Mm -hmm. um, and at the moment, they do a thing um, that's really cool where they do, time condensing where you see the same subject like moving around in video. So it'd be like your dog in the kitchen and there's like five of the dog mm -hmm. and they're all moving around. And right. you know, um, that's, it's st still video output. Mm -hmm. You can certainly condense it to even further to a photo, but um, you know, I think you're getting some of the benefits there. You're getting this like crazy time compression where they're just selecting out the moments that are interesting and then merging them further into kind of a sped up multi-subject view. Um, and when it's really interesting that now you're moving beyond just like standard data visualization techniques. And last month we had um, mm -hmm. Ellen Lupton come in and she talked about you know like uh, designing for sensation and all the other mm -hmm. sensations um, that you're impacting with your design. And uh, we've got a few people who are interested in like disability and you know like talkback and voice yeah, you yeah. know interfaces. I'm wondering if you've seen uh, besides photos, besides um, data points and visualization might not be the right word, but uh -huh. like visualization happening in a different sensory. Well, people approach. have been doing um, sonification of mm -hmm. data. So, you know, using sound in order to express data. Mm -hmm. And one example I heard that was working really well was at, uh, at CERN where they were looking at um, the particle smashing at the, 
the particle accelerator. Mm -hmm. And that data is just really, really complicated. But when you turn it into sounds, they were saying that you were able to hear some of the differences and some of the like, interesting pieces of it mm -hmm. um, through that approach. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, that's it for my questions. Okay. Thanks, you guys.